The U.S. withdrawal and Taliban takeover of Afghanistan last August prompted hundreds of thousands of Afghans to flee their home country. Over the last year, more than 76,000 of them were evacuated to the United States and most entered on humanitarian parole, which allows them to live and work in the U.S. for two years. Nick Schifrin and producer Valerie Plesch spoke with two refugees whose lives are hanging in the balance as they face uncertainty over their immigration status one year on. In suburban Virginia, every brushstroke illustrates irreplaceable loss. Red paint for danger, a painting for a one-year anniversary, one year of fear and silence. It was a day that vanished the hopes of all Afghan women. So the colors I chose are based on the current situation in Afghanistan. The artist Jahan Ararafi is a refugee 7,000 miles from home. Can you show me some of the art? Yeah. Her new series of paintings is called Women in Red, girls and women whose lives, like her own, were shattered after last year's Taliban takeover. One group faces the horizon, united in prayer. You can see women around a dry tree. They tied fabrics in the tree, as is their cultural tradition. Because all the doors of hope are closed for Afghan women now. They don't have any option other than to pray. Today, Rafi is one of the lucky ones. Her niece and nephew, twins, already lived in the States. She escaped on an evacuation flight last August. Just hours after a suicide bomber killed hundreds of Afghans and 13 U.S. service members at a makeshift airport entrance, the Abbey Gate, Rafi knew she had to leave. I was afraid because I was a female artist and all my artwork was about women's lives. So we decided to leave Afghanistan until we are able to breathe again. And you boarded the plane and the plane took off. Can you tell me what you were thinking as you had to leave Kabul? When I was looking at my people inside the airplane, a plane that was probably meant for 100 people, but there were more than six or 700 people inside. I was crying for Kabul, that its people were displaced. I cried for the land where neither women nor men were valued. There was no art in that land anymore, only a dark regime that had taken over. That day, she had to leave all her paintings behind. She brought only three books that immortalized her art. And this is your work right here? Yeah. An international contemporary art catalog. Make art, not war. Make art, not war. A series of her paintings exhibited in Germany. This was the first meeting. And the origin of the work that makes her most proud. Rafi helped start the country's first contemporary art center and taught a class of young women. When a society doesn't have art, it's as if that place is unknown. Art and culture are a country's identity. Women are part of society, same as men. When a boy can learn art, why can't a girl? In Virginia, her day begins at 8 a.m. when she says goodbye to her father and leaves their apartment. When she arrived here, a social worker helped her find a job. She was actually offered two, but chose the closest one to her house, a bakery inside her local Giant supermarket. Has it been in the bakery at Giant? I don't know whether I should say fortunately or unfortunately. My job involves designing cakes. Fortunately, because we are in peace and unfortunately, because we are refugees and we don't have a country, and there's a feeling of emptiness. And uncertainty. Rafi is on humanitarian parole that allows her to live and work in the U.S. for two years. She wants to return to Kabul when it's safe. Until then, she's applying for asylum. I think every Afghan who has been evacuated has two years residence permit. Based on what I have heard, after one year, we would be allowed to apply for permanent residence. At this moment, that is more aspirational than reality. Krish Omara Vignaraja is the president and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. It's helping refugees who arrived last year resettle. They entered the U.S. on a temporary status called humanitarian parole. But of course, the drawback of it is that it only provides that short-term protection. What are their options for staying in the United States? So their real pathway at this moment is asylum. The asylum system is extremely backlogged. It's complex. It typically requires a lawyer to help navigate it. And for the individuals who come, 
time is of the essence, and frankly, they don't have the resources to be able to always get a lawyer to navigate it. She calls on Congress to pass newly introduced legislation, the Afghan Adjustment Act. It would adjust the status of an Afghan in the U.S., currently here on humanitarian parole, to, quote, lawfully admitted for permanent residence. Essentially, would allow is for an adjustment from humanitarian parole, which would allow them to apply for a green card and then ultimately get uh, citizenship. It would be an unprecedented failure if Congress didn't, because they have done this for every modern wartime evacuation population, whether that's been uh, the Vietnamese, the Cubans, the Iraqi Kurds. And so I, I do have faith that we will do this for the Afghans. When I arrived here, somebody just told me, uh, United States of America is a land of opportunity. In another Virginia suburb, this Afghan also evacuated Kabul last August. We're keeping him anonymous. He's a former officer who used to hunt for Taliban spies inside the Afghan military. We removed those people. Those are worked for, for Taliban, for ISIS, for terrorist groups. Those are not accept democracy. Those are not accept human rights. I think my future will be here. Why is that? If I go to Afghanistan, they catch me and they kill me. And so he's trying to make this rental house feel like a home. But his cooking isn't as good as his mom's or his wife's. And there's no father to talk to, the family he had to leave behind. Do you talk to your family in Kabul now? Every day. What do they say? They say they're trying too much to find you. The Taliban is the hunting Taliban. for you. Mm -hmm. Several times. Uh, they came into my home and they told us, where's your son? And my family just told him, my son's not working as a military officer. He was just a student. And right now he is in Turkey or Iran. They have to lie. Yeah, they have to lie. It's really difficult because I love my family. I miss them. It's not easy for a father or for a mother to live without his son. In the U.S., he's applied for jobs at Giant Supermarket and Walmart, but was rejected. He just got a new job running cables for local IT workers, but every day he drives Uber Eats. This order is from a local Taco Bell, two tacos and two drinks. The delivery is to a nearby residential building. The trip takes him about 15 minutes. Over two to three hours of driving, he'll make 15 to 20 bucks. So after all you've been through, what's it like to be doing Uber Eats here? One day I hope to don't deliver foods to people. <laughs> One day I hope to get a school to learn skills. But uh, right now I have to drive uh, because I have to support my family back home. And I have to support myself also. He's also applying for asylum and he hopes to bring his family here. He dreams of creating a home for himself and others like him. What do you hope for your life here in the U.S.? I hope one day I open my own business in America. I will help another refugees, not just from my country, from other countries, to live in America. Perhaps like Rafi. Over the last year, she's exhibited her work in Washington, D.C. She dreams of being the change she wants to see. My past work delivered messages of despair. I want to bring some changes to my artwork to show the hope, smiles, and happiness that Afghan women feel. I'm coming from a country where women were always deprived. My goal is to use my art to be the voice of these women. I want to voice their message to the world. And she has become that voice that many of them do not have. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Nick Schifrin.